sound of the patter of little feet, don't you? Amen. A lot of churches across the land today don't have little feet in their churches. You, you mostly have an older generation with not many kids, and it's just I'm so thankful to have them. I'd rather have a church where the there's streaks on the wall where the little handprints have, you know, put their fingers down the wall and they've spilt stuff on the, the those padded pews and that sort of thing. I'd rather have a church full of stuff like that than to have a, a dead church. And thank you, God, we don't have a dead church. Amen. Amen. And we're glad you're here today to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a it's a great great day, and uh, I want to read one of the passages to you this morning of the resurrection. If you'll go with me to Matthew 28, and we're not going to read all four of them, but there are four passages you can change, check them. Let me turn this thing on here. Here we go. You can check them later and read them uh, to your family at, at another time, but I want to read just this one this morning as we begin today's message from Matthew chapter 28. If y'all will stand with me, let's stand in honor of God's word while I read it out loud. You read it on the screen or... I won't have it on the screen, but you'll need to read it in your in your Bibles if you have it there. And uh, let me read it out loud to you. In the end of the Sabbath, it began to be the dawn toward the first day of the week. Came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment as white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. The angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, whom was crucified. He's not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee, and there ye shall see him, I have told you. They departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy, and did run to bring his disciples' word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail! And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid. Go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there they shall see me. Let's begin with prayer today as we think about the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Are you ready? Lord Jesus, I thank you so much that you accomplished your mission on the earth, Lord. You set your face to Jerusalem, and you, against all odds, you made it there, Lord. You made it to the cross, and you paid for the sins of the world with, with your body, Lord. And then they buried you in that tomb, and then three days later, you came back from the dead, just like you said you would. Today we celebrate that, and we appreciate so much what you did for us. In the name of Jesus, I pray. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. You can be seated. This morning, as we think about the resurrection, really... You know, in the question, can we prove it? The resurrection of Jesus is really the most important part of Christianity. Most important part. If it didn't occur, then why was history measured all those years, A.D. and B.C.? Now, they changed it in recent years, the last 20 years or so. Secular uh, historical revisionists have changed it to, you know, in the, in the common era and that sort of thing. But before that, for, two, for the last... 400 years, it's been measured B.C. and A.D., before Christ and then in the year of our Lord. You can't read a novel written back in those days that does not say, in the year of our Lord, such and such and such, because history was measured by Jesus' life. And, and if the resurrection didn't occur, then history, Christianity is not true. It's not true. It's, it's a farce if it didn't happen. Uh, think about this for a minute. If... if if we didn't occur, then we've got to reject the rest of what the Bible says. If, if, if Jesus' body is over there in Israel somewhere in a cave or in a tomb and has not been raised, then this book isn't true, okay? And, and we need to throw it away. We need to reject the rest of it if, if the resurrection isn't true because Christianity is based upon that central truth. So just this morning as we, we look at this, look at what Paul said in uh, 1 Corinthians he said, if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. And we apostles would all be lying about God, for we have said that God raised Christ from the grave. But that can't be true if there's no resurrection of the dead. And if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you're still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. 
Think about it for a minute. Think about that for a minute. Those that say they were saved, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then the ones that died, just they're just dead. They're still in the tomb, and they'll never be raised if he didn't raise himself up on resurrection day. Paul went on to say, he said, if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead and is the first of a great harvest of all who died. Paul made some tremendous statements there about this scripture that he wrote to the Corinthians, you know, some 55 years after Jesus' crucifixion. And it was written down, you know, fairly quickly after that happened. So you had eyewitnesses that were still alive when he wrote this down. You could go back and verify what was said. But he said, if the resurrection is not true, our preaching is vain. It's useless. It's, I mean, I might as well be quoting poetry as reading this story if it's not true. So it's useless if it didn't occur. Your faith is vain. It's useless if it didn't occur. If, it, if the resurrection didn't occur, then forget the rest of it. And also, we're false witnesses of God. We're liars if it didn't occur. I'm lying to you this morning if the resurrection did not occur. And then if, he, if the resurrection didn't occur, we're still unforgiven in our sinful state. The resurrection is critical in what we believe. And people who died believing in Christ are gone forever. They're just somewhere in the ground. And there will be no resurrection for them if Jesus didn't rise from the dead. And we all lead a very miserable life if the resurrection didn't occur. If the resurrection didn't occur, then you need to reject the Bible and go party your, yourselves to death, okay? Because if the resurrection didn't occur, don't lead a Christian life. Don't walk with Christ if the resurrection didn't occur. But we really believe from all our hearts that it did occur. And Second Peter said it this way. We were naked, not making up clever stories when we told you about the powerful coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We saw his majestic splendor with our own eyes. You had eyewitnesses that wrote these things down for us, and they told us the story, the true story about Christ and about his resurrection. So let's look this morning at the resurrection and see if we can find some facts and can be substantiated. Are you ready? You want to know why we believe what we believe? This is why we believe in Christ. And we'll give you the reasons today because if this isn't true, then reject the rest of it. Throw your Bible away and reject the rest of it. But we believe the resurrection is 100% true. First, you have a testimony of a highly educated Jew. Paul was educated at the feet of Gamaliel, one of the leading rabbis of the day. You might as well say he went to the Harvard of our day and studied the, the, the Old Testament and the Old Testament law. He knew it like the back of his hands. He was a Pharisee. Pharisee meaning the most religious people there, the Sadducees and Pharisees, the two sects of the, the religious Jews, and he was one of them. He was so religious, he was the one that was stoning people that believed in Christ until his conversion. And, and Paul wrote this, 1 Corinthians, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye received, and wherein ye stand, by which ye also are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. There are people out there today that talk about the full gospel. You, they tell us, you don't have the full gospel. You have to learn what we can teach so you'll have the full gospel. No, this is the full gospel. And I'm getting ready to give you what, the full, what Paul said was the, the full gospel. And here's what he said, For I delivered unto you, First of all, that which I also received, how that, raise your finger up, Christ died for our sins, okay, that's the first part of the gospel, according to the scripture, put your second finger up, that he was buried, and he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures, the three parts of the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, that is the full gospel, and that's what we believe in, and for salvation, it's believing in what Jesus did on the cross. Then Paul, Paul goes on to say, he was seen of Peter, and his real name was Cephas, but his English name Peter, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of more than 500 brothers or brethren at one time, of whom the greater part are still alive. They remain until this present time. When he was writing 1 Corinthians, they were still alive. He could go back and talk to them, get the eyewitnesses account, not just what he was writing. He said, he said but some are falling asleep. They had died by this time. Now, you had this highly educated Jewish man, Jewish Pharisee, 
attesting to the fact the resurrection did occur. You know, we saw him. We talked to him. Then you have the, the testimony of a medical doctor in Acts chapter 1. Medical doctor. Anybody know who that, the medical doctor was? Luke. Dr. Luke. So Dr. Luke wrote these things down, and here's what he said. He said, The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus both began to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he, through the Holy Ghost, has given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them for forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. You got this medical doctor of that day saying, it's true, you know, and, and he was writing to this other Greek friend of his and saying, I'm, I'm going to tell you what all happened. And he, of course, the book of Acts, he tells the whole story. And he's telling him here, listen, this was not fables that were made up and passed from generation to generation. This is what we saw. We knew him. We were with him. We, we, we touched him. We ate with him. So you had a testimony of a Jewish rabbi, student, and teacher, and then you had this medical doctor. Then you have this doubting disciple convinced. Any of you or y'all, do you ever fall on the side of doubt? Or do you, do you like to make sure people prove stuff to you? Who's skeptical out there? I'm a little skeptical. You better show me. You tell me one thing, I might go, yeah, mm -hmm, but I'm going to be watching you because I don't always believe what people say. This was how this guy was in John chapter 20, verse 19. Then the same day at evening, the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, when the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, then came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had said so, he showed them his hands and his side. But Thomas, here's the doubting guy. You, you've heard of doubting Thomas, right? Well, that's him. He, Thomas wasn't there. They were having church. He wasn't there. You ever miss church and they, come, they tell you, hey, you really missed it. You should have been here, right? Hey, oh, by the way, y'all should have been here life action. Huh? Those of you that were here, did they miss it? Yeah, man, we missed it. They, I forgot to do this. If you hosted people in your home, the, the singers and teenagers this week, stand up for a minute. Let us see you for a minute. You hosted them. Give them the hand. Amen. You should have been here. <laughs> we'll just say it that way. You should have been here. Thomas should have been there. Next time we have them, make sure you're there because you're missing out if you don't. But he, Thomas missed out. He, you know, Then Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with him when Jesus came. The other disciples said unto him, We've seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I see the handprints of the nails, put my finger in the front of the nails, and thrust my hand into the side, I will not believe. Are you some of you like that? Prove it. Prove it to me. Well, that's Thomas. That was old Thomas. He said, After eight days, again his disciples were there, and Thomas was with them. And then Jesus came again, doors being shut, and stood in there and said, Peace be unto you. He said to Thomas, Hey, come here, buddy. <laughs> There's a mark. Come touch him, you know. Touch my side. Here it is. There's a wound in the side. The mark's still there. And uh, he said, Be not faithless, believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord, my God. He fell down and worshiped Jesus. Now, if you think about what the highlight of the whole New Testament is, that's the verse right there. The whole New Testament, that is the apex of the whole New Testament because of who Jesus really was. See, some people, well, he was just God's son and God's little boy and he can't, no. He was the great God of heaven that became flesh and dwelt among us. And he came and he put himself on the cross for us and he paid that penalty. And here he didn't say, get up, Thomas, don't, don't worship me as God. No, Thomas worshipped him as who he said he was. In fact, we were studying in Sunday school this morning. You remember when Moses, came, uh, God sent him to the children of Israel? Remember that? He said, I want you to go and deliver them from Egypt. And he said, I don't know if I can do it. He said, no, you need to go tell them. I'm going I'm to do it. I'm going to show you how to do it. Remember, he threw his, He said, take your stick and throw it down, and you'll be doing miracles with that stick, remember? And he said, well, what do I tell them your name is? I go there, and they're going to say, what is, what is God's name? He said, you tell them I am sent you. He said, what? He said, tell them I am sent you. What? That's kind of a weird name, I am. John 8. Around verse 57, 58, Jesus said to the Pharisees, he said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He said, he rejoiced in the day. He said, you're not even 50 years old. Jesus is 33 by that time, you know, it's so 32 or 33. He said,
said, you, you're not even 30, you're not 50 years old. You've seen Abraham who lived hundreds and hundreds of years before? Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. He used the very name that God used in the Old Testament. So don't come up with this patronizing nonsense about Jesus being some great moral teacher. You know, C.S. Lewis said, he's either who he said he was or he's a liar, okay? And he claimed to be God. He claimed div divinity. So understand who Jesus is. And here Thomas worships him. He says, my Lord and my God. And really the apex of the New Testament. So this morning as we examine the resurrection, I want to give you ten historical facts you can take home with you today. And, and ten historical facts that prove beyond a shadow of a doubt Christianity is true. The resurrection is true. The first one is eyewitness testimony. Eyewitness testimony. He was seen by more than 500 people at one time. Not just a few guys in the, up in a room somewhere and they were all, oh, let's see Jesus, you know, and they imagine they saw this spook came and appeared. No, he was seen by more than 500 people at one time. Here's what uh, a skeptical lawyer of our time said about this particular appearance of Jesus. He said, Yale Law School trained me to be rational, and my years of sniffing for news at the Chicago Tribune had only toughened my cynical personality. He said, but intrigued by changes in my wife after she became a Christian, I spent nearly two years studying evidence for the resurrection. I merged, convicted, and gave my life to Christ. I have covered scores of criminal trials as a legal affairs journalist, but I never saw one with 515 witnesses. <laughs> and that's Lee Strobel. He's written numerous books. We have them in our library if you'd like to check them out. One of them is called, and this came out of The Case for Christ. And I would encourage you to, to do your own research and, and study the resurrection on your own. Read some of Lee Strobel's research. So you have this eyewitness testimony. The eyewitness testimony of, of more than 500 people. This one piece of evidence shoots down three popular theories about what really happened to Jesus. And if you've ever read anything like the Passover plot and some of those books, they come up with these theories about what happened. And one of them was that they just lied about it. The disciples made up the story that Jesus was resurrected and they maybe hid the body or something. They just lied, made up lies. Well, this eyewitness testimony shoots that theory down. You know, lie theory fails if you study eyewitness testimony. And also the swoon theory, that's another theory. They said Jesus really didn't die. They crucified him. They put him in that, that cool, dark tomb, and, and he, he kind of revived, you know, and, and you know, got, got better, and he finally got enough strength to roll that stone by itself out of the way and came out and, I'm resurrected, you know. And No, he, he didn't swoon. Why? Because we know that the Romans could kill people. They were good at it. Yeah, they, they knew how to kill people. And that's when they finally jobbed the spirit him at the end. That was a final death blow to make sure he was dead. Remember what the Bible says, what happened? That he's blood and water came out. You know what that means? It pierced the pericardium. Your sac around your heart has water in it. Okay, So not only the blood, the, they knew how where the heart was, and they took that spear and rammed it into his heart, snatched it out, and all that blood and water came out. He was dead. It, he didn't just fake it. There was, the swoon theory is a, is a lie, and it, the lie theory doesn't work either. And then they said, well, maybe they just hallucinated. They wanted to see Jesus so bad, and they were... Oh, they were meditating, you know, and they were in that dark, that that upper room, and and like, you know, oh, we want to see Jesus so bad, you know, oh, and then this hallucination appears. No, 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 hallucinations are private events. I might hallucinate, you might hallucinate, but we ain't gonna have the same hallucination. All of you hip, former hippies, any former hippies out there? Raise your hand if you're a former hippie. Raise your. You got some old people out. They won't admit it now, but some of them, some of these people out here used to smoke stuff. They used to do mushrooms and a lot of weird stuff. Don't raise your hand. We don't want to know, we don't want to identify you. And I knew I'd, I'd never did it because mom and daddy were tied on us. But my friends did. They hallucinated a lot. You know, they tell you, "Well, oh, man, we saw this." But, well, the theory against the, the resurrection and against Christ says that the disciples hallucinated. They just saw hallucination. Nah, it didn't work. You know why? Modern science proves that wrong because. Hallucinations are private events. You might have one, and I might have one, but it ain't going to be the same thing. <laughs> we won't see the same hallucination. 
So that failed. So that's not that didn't happen. The lie theory failed. Swoon theory failed. See, and then you have the second reason that it's true is the lives of these fraidy cat disciples were transformed. What happened to these guys? Where were they when Jesus was crucified? Hiding. <laughs> they, the only one we know of that came near the cross was John. Remember, he said, "There's John. Take care of Mama." You know, he told him, "Take care of Mary." You know, that's the only one we know that was there. The rest of them ran and hid. But suddenly, you know, you have these fraidy cat disciples preaching the gospel everywhere, saying, "We saw him alive." And liars don't make good martyrs. Okay, so the lie theory fails again because these fraidy cat disciples are now. Fearless, they're preaching the gospel all over the Roman Empire at that time. And they said, we saw him alive, we touched him, we ate with him. You know, you know, liars don't make good martyrs. That would have killed Christianity day one or day two or within the first month or so. You know, they, they, if they weren't, <laughs> they went to their deathbed saying, hey, we saw him alive. So these fearless men became, or fearful men became fearless men. And all died martyrs except John. Every one of them gave their life saying it was true. <laughs> We saw him, we touched him, we ate with him. So that's the second one. Later on, though, in the book of Acts, it, it was said about these same fearful men. It said, these that have turned the world upside down have come here also. I was, I was doing a little re reading this week on, on the impact of Christianity. You wouldn't believe all the things that happened because of the impact of Christianity on the Roman Empire and on Asia Minor of that time dealing with prejudice and all that sort of stuff. It's amazing what Christianity did and how it delivered the world from all sorts of different things that people shouldn't do. Third reason, early testimony. Remember a while ago I said it was that uh, 1 Corinthians was written down pretty early. Uh, by 55, 50 to 55 AD, it was written down. Okay, It takes years and years and years for myths and legends to develop. Jesus died in 33 A.D., so some 20 years later, 25 years later, it's being written down from eyewitness accounts. Uh, facts 20 years old can be readily recalled and remembered. How many of you were alive when JFK got shot? I know right where I was. I was 12 years old. I remember where I was standing when we heard John F. Kennedy, our president, has been assassinated. I can tell you exactly where I was. I can tell you what happened. I can tell you every item about that in detail because it was so vivid in my mind. That was 1963. How many years is that? How many years? Somebody, mathematician. 51. 61. 61 years ago, I can readily tell you verbatim facts of the crucifixion, assassination, not crucifixion, assassination of President John F. Kennedy. Why can I do that? Well, because we, me we remember stuff. Here, they're writing, eyewitnesses are writing down the account only 25 or so years later. So it's early testimony. It's not like hundreds of years and, and stories passed down to mossy back preachers to, you know, blah, 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 just... You keep repeating these stories and writing them down. No, it takes, it takes a lot longer to develop myths and legends. And here you have eyewitnesses still around. See, there's not enough time for myths and legends to develop. So don't, don't believe that nonsense when people tell you that. No, no, eyewitness testimony, early testimony. Then you have the empty tomb. <laughs> Duh, if, if he didn't rise from the dead, produce the body, okay? They've had 2,000 years to find the body. The Jews had the means and the motive to do it. Where was the body? Why didn't they produce the body? If, if it's not true, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, where's the body? The empty tomb, there's a grave robbery, by the way, carried a death penalty. Do you really think those Frady Cat disciples that were hiding, scared to death, scared out of their britches, and they were hiding at the crucifixion, they're going to come out long enough to steal the body? I don't think so. They weren't brave enough to be there at the cross. They certainly weren't going to go steal a body and take a chance of getting killed. No. So where was the body? Very unlikely they were brave enough to come out of hiding to steal that body. Uh, and then number five, lack of Christ critical testimony refuting the resurrection. Listen, all they had to do was produce a body. They had plenty of people that didn't believe in Jesus, didn't want to believe, and the non-believing critics 
could not disprove it. Produce the body. Disprove it. Shut Christianity down in the first century. All you had to do was produce the body. Disprove it then, but they couldn't do it. The Jews had the means and the motive for disproving it. They certainly didn't believe in Jesus. They hated Jesus. They turned him over to the Romans to be crucified. Yet they could not produce the body, and they could not answer the empty tomb. They couldn't produce the body of Jesus. Think about it. They couldn't stop the spread of the message. The message of the gospel spread around the entire world. It's still spreading. Do you know the Bible is still the, the most sold book and read book in the world? Some 5.6 billion copies and climbing all the time. Why is it, why is it still spreading? Spreading around the world. It used to Christi- Christianity, the center of Christianity was in America, America, South America, and England. Do you know where it is now? Central Africa. <laughs> still spreading, but it came from there, it's going back. Now it's spreading all over that part of the world again. What caused that? Why couldn't they stop the spread of it? Well, because it was true. That's why. Then you have the existence of the Christian church. Where in the world do these churches like ours come from? Listen, they didn't exist before Christ. Well, they had synagogues, no, no churches, and nothing they called a Christian church. Where did it come from? This brand new movement following Jesus suddenly appeared on the scene, and churches were being built everywhere. You can go across America right now. A lot of them have closed, but you can go almost every community there's a church. Go down 39th Avenue sometime and count the Christian churches between here and the airport. It'll blow your mind to know how many Christian churches are right here on 39th Avenue. And that's all over America. It's all over the world. There are Christian churches. This brand new movement following Jesus. Churches sprang up around the world. The Christian church didn't exist before this. So that's a great proof for, for the resurrection that something happened that caused these churches to, to come. Then... On top of that, Sunday worship. Where did that come from? Do you know when people worship before Christ? When is the Sabbath, by the way? Saturday. Sunday's not the Sabbath. Some people, I go on, no, we don't go on the Sabbath. We go on the Lord's Day, which is Sunday. Do you know what day of the week Sunday is? First day of the week. We always think Sunday's the weekend. No, it's the first day of the week. Why do we meet on Sunday? Because the disciples met on the first day of the week after the resurrection. That's where it came from. Now, some people today that follow the Old Testament law, they think we're pagans because we don't worship on the Jewish Sabbath. We don't do that because we're not Jewish, number one. The Sabbath was a sign between the Jew and God. It wasn't a sign between the Christian church and believers like you and God. It was a sign between God and his his original choice of the Jews. But we suddenly, Sunday worship, where'd that come from? Well, it started after the resurrection, another proof of the resurrection. Then you have... Uh, you know, thousands of years of Jews, Jews worshiping on Sabbath, Saturday, and suddenly this brand new movement worshiping on a different day, worshiping the risen Christ. Why did they do it on the first day of the week? Well, that's the day he came out of the dead. Okay, that's why the first day of the week. When they got there, he'd already been risen at the beginning of that first day of the week. Then you have number eight, conversion of Saul of Tarsus. Who was he? Well, he was, remember we started with that religious Jewish Teacher at the beginning, the, you know, talking about how smart he was and went to studying under Gamaliel, kind of like the Harvard of, of their day. Saul of Tarsus was a radical Jew. He was killing Christians. He was hunting them down and killing them. Uh, a leading Jew suddenly changes his mind and starts following Christ. The persecutor of Christian changes his mind and changes his direction, and he becomes the number one missionary that, of all time. Saul of Tarsus, what in the world changed his life? What changed his mind? Well, he met the, you know, he met the Christ. He met the resurrected living Christ. And then you have the conversion of Jesus' brother James. You say, oh, that would be easy. Your family always going to follow you. Uh, no, no, no. Your family sometimes knows you better than other people. How many of you have a brothers or sisters? Raise your hand. I have, I'm, a, I'm the oldest of six. We know each other pretty well. They would know and could tell you if I was snowing you, okay? I could tell you if they were snowing you. Say, why? Well, we know each other pretty well. We grew up together, right? James grew up with Jesus, and he didn't always believe. And it it took a real conversion experience for him to to believe. And, in fact, 
He'd been an unbeliever at one time. They came to take Jesus home because of all the tremendous things he was saying. They came to take him home like there's something wrong with my brother. We're going to go get him, take him home. Remember that? <laughs> you know, yet they didn't. He, he kept serving God and doing what he was supposed to do. Didn't go home with his family when they came to get him, but they didn't always believe. His family didn't always believe. So you can fool some of the people some of the time. Can't fool your brother. And yet James became a great, great follower of Christ and later was a great, great pastor in the church. Then you have number 10. Jesus predicted his own resurrection ahead of time. It's one thing to, to die and come back from death. It's another thing to say, kill me, and in three days I'm coming back. And he kept saying that. And, they, and people, what? What are you talking about? He said, destroy my temple. You know, and they said, man, it took us so many years to build this temple. You know, he wasn't talking about the physical temple. He was talking about his body. And he said, in three days I'll come back. He said, from that time on, Jesus from that time forth, Jesus began to show his disciples how he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things of the elders and chief and priests and scribes, and be killed and be raised again the third day. And also mentioned in Matthew. But he told them and told them and told them it's coming. It's going to happen. You know, so he's predicting his own death, burial, and resurrection ahead of time. Kind of gives him a little more uh, credibility than other people that might tell you something, huh? Now here's a Final thought from the world's greatest lawyer. According to the Guinness Book of Records, this guy, Sir Lionel Luku, is the most accomplished lawyer on the planet. Okay, This man won 245 acqu murder acquittals in a row, either before jury or before, before appeal. I think Trump needs to hire him, don't you? Uh, can you... If you're going to be charged for murder, don't you think you'd like this guy representing you? 245 acquittals in a row? Pretty good lawyer, huh? He was twice knighted by Queen Elizabeth. Here's what he said. I say unequivocally, the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ is so overwhelming that it compels acceptance by proof which leaves absolutely no room for doubt. The world's greatest lawyer made that statement. No room for doubt. It's true. It happened, just like the Bible said. So, resurrection of Jesus is a historical fact. He's alive today. When we, when we ask you to follow him, we're not asking you to, to, to follow some old myths and fables that people have made up over centuries. Listen, if that's all it is, throw it away. If the resurrection didn't occur, burn your Bible. Okay. But it did occur. It's true. And when we call on you to follow him, that's who, we're, that's who we're calling on you to follow. And that's who we're asking you to believe in, that Jesus. He did it all for you. He did it for me and you. He did it for the sins of the world. And this is what you should put your faith in this morning. That's what I'm asking you to put your faith in. When we ask you to follow Christ, I'm asking you to follow the resurrected Christ. Not little baby Jesus, meek in a manger. Not the one that people say hid his body and stole his body and lied. No. I'm talking about the Christ that was raised from the dead the third day that we celebrate on Easter. It's not it's hitting the day it happened, but we, we set aside a day to celebrate Easter. And we meet on the first day of the week in honor of the resurrection. That's what we're asking you to put your faith in. So maybe, maybe you're here today and you have never totally committed your life to Christ yet. Maybe you've heard it. Maybe you've, you've been, you've been in, under the sound of preaching like this before. Maybe you haven't. Listen, the Bible says, If thou confess in my, house, in my, my heart the Lord Jesus, and believe in my heart, or confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised from the dead, you can be saved. And that's all we're asking you to do. Make that decision in your life that you actually follow the risen Christ, not the dead Jesus, not the fake Jesus, not the, the Jesus that a lot of people worship the wrong Jesus. Listen, I'm talking about the resurrected Jesus this morning. That's who I want you to put your faith in. Maybe you're here today, and this is going to be your day that you make that decision. We hope you will. Every church out there that's preaching this message today, we hope they hope you will. We want you to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And what that does, we'll talk about it next time or the time after, there are a lot of benefits that happen as a result of your belief. But it's all, it all happens because of what he did 
We sang about that cross. Well, you remember singing about the cross? That wonderful cross. You say, oh, that's gory. Well, what happened on that cross is so critical. What he did on, on, for you on that cross. He paid your penalty and a lot of other issues that you don't even think about yet. What he did on that cross for you. And all he wants for that to be applied for your life, to your life, is that you believe in him and accept him. So let's bow our heads and close our eyes. We're going to close the surface, surface with a just an appeal to you. This is not Bill Keith's appeal because I'm just the messenger boy, okay? The Bible calls Christians like me ambassadors from God. And we, it says we want you to be reconciled to God. What does that mean? We want you to make peace with God today. When, when I counsel married couples and they're fighting and about to tear each other's hair out and they come and we ask God to intervene and God intervenes and we reconcile them with God's help and put them back together. They make up. That's all this is, is you making up with God. Okay, you making a decision to, to put down the, the sword as you've been fighting against him. You've been resisting him. You've been not liking him. You've been not believing in him. But today, maybe God has touched your heart. And you say, I've realized that he did it all for me. When he went to that cross, it was for me. And he really he wants to have a good relationship with me. And really all he wants is you to surrender your life to that, to that knowledge about him and what he did. Are you that man or that woman today that needs to just surrender to him? Is that you? If you are, all you need to do is do in simple faith, reach out to him. And I'm going to offer what we call the sinner's prayer. It's not magical. It's not a, a formula. It's just a simple statement from you to God. And all he wants is, is you to bow the knee to him. And, and as I pray this prayer to him, you pray it in your heart and really mean business with him. Say, Lord, I've been on the wrong side. And I realized this morning, Lord, that when you died on the cross, you died for me. You died for my sin. And, Lord, you went to the grave. They buried you. And three days later, you came back from the dead alive. And, Lord, today I, I admit that. I believe that. And I confess that with my mouth that you did that. And you did it for me. And today I want you to be my Savior, my Lord. I want that forgiveness for me. And today I'm going to turn my life over to you. I'm going to put my sword down and quit fighting it. And I'm going to let you come into my life and make me what you want me to be. And from here on out, just like the old Saul of Tarsus did a long time ago when he was killing Christians, Lord, I'm going to quit fighting against you. And I'm going to let you work in my life. Will you, will you work in my life today, Lord? Today I ask you in, I ask you to please come into my life and change me from the inside out. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now if that was you, if you did that, I can't judge you. I don't know who you, I don't know who you are. I know you, but I don't know you, you know what I mean? That's a personal thing between you and God. If you want more help with that, if you want to grow in your, your walk with him, James, if you and Debbie will go to that prayer room back there. I'm going to send a couple back there. If you, if you did that today, you made that choice, just stop by and say, hey, I, I started on my journey today with the Lord. That's all it is. It's a journey, okay? Between now and the time we either die or the time when the Lord comes and takes us to heaven, it's a journey. We start with a belief, and we grow from there. And that's all this is, is to help you get, it, get started, number one, and then grow from there. So they'll be back there to help you if you want to pray. If you, if you are already a believer, and you want to just turn things around, go back there and let them pray with you. Just say, hey, I, I want to turn around and start really cooperating with God. I've been fighting and fighting him and fighting everything else, and just I've been miserable. I'd like, I'd like a change. Go back there and let them pray with you, and they will. We love you very much. Thank you for coming and celebrating Easter with us today. We hope you'll come back, and you're welcome here anytime, and come and, and spend time with us. And we will try to do you good. As Moses told his father-in-law, he said, come join with us and go with us. We'll, we'll try to do you good. And that's what this church is all about. We're just a, a, a collection of people that have come to Christ in our own lives. We're not, we sure aren't, we're all a mess. We, never, we ain't got it all figured out yet. <laughs> but we all made the right choice. And we're, we're on that road. And we're going we're gonna to keep learning more about him and becoming more like him the longer we live. So if you want to be a part of a bunch of people like that, we take anybody. We don't care what you look like, what you smell like. Hey, we like everybody. <laughs>
but we'd love, love for you to be a part of this church family. Go back and tell them, say, hey, I'll, tell me more about how to, how to join up with this bunch of, bunch of old guys and girls that are following the Lord, and we'll be, we'll, we'll be excited to have you in our midst. Amen? Let's all stand for prayer.